Huge thank you to everyone who signed our petition to have the Babylon job coaches speak directly with parents. Right now, our son Nicholas, who's only partially verbal, cannot tell us what his day was like, is with a job coach four periods a day, and those job coaches are not required, not even permitted, to speak directly with parents. We cannot talk to them. We've never met them. The, any, any questions we have has to go through administration. We want that to change. We have 200 signatures so far. Please, we need 2,000 or 20,000. Click the link in the description and sign our petition. Hey. Oh. What's, <laughs> what's happening, Nikki? Yes. How are you? Yes, sir. You being a lazy bones today, huh? Yeah. We're going to go in the shower. We're going to give you a shave. Haircut. Chilling. All that stuff. Are you good? Yes. How do you feel? You happy? I'm happy. All right. All right. I look a little annoyed. Okay. He's like, I'm on my phone. I'm doing things. It's going to be a great day. Sure is beautiful out there today. Hello. 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 How are you, handsome? Are you having a good day? I'll say. Nikki, are you happy? I like that little hop, skip, and a jump. Nikki, you guys are going to paint? I don't think you can hear anything. He's got his headphones in. Why don't we go? Do you want to go to the beach? It's really beautiful out. It looks beautiful. I mean, I wouldn't know because I was upstairs taking a nap, but from the window. From the window. It looks, in looks incredible. Right, Rocky, Kira? Nikki, hey Nick James. Excuse me. I'm so glad. Are you gonna paint? Yes. Do you want to go to the beach with yes. mommy and daddy? Yes. And maybe Aunt Jean is gonna come. Okay. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Okay. All right, fantastic. Okay. You're always up for a good time. Okay. Oh my God, that thing has your back pulsating. Let's take those off. Let's try to let's try to do some yoga. You feel better. I just turned it on. We have to only get this full set. Okay. All right. You got it. Well, on a good note, the jobs coach gave us actually some homework to do, which is fantastic. He's making a coping box, which is obviously some kind of self-regulation tool, I assume, right? Yeah. So yeah. if they're they're not doing good, they go and get their coping box. Yeah. And what are there going to be tools and stuff in there? Yes. That's exciting. Rocky's overseeing the situation. Taking up most of the floor. So I have an old shoe box and of course his favorite color, so I have him painting it blue. Fantastic. And then we'll print out some Stop pictures right. and we'll put oh. them on the inside. Oh, I love it. Mm-hmm. And that's some sensory things we could put in there. Okay, great. Yeah. Nikki, what color are you doing? Perfect. What color are you doing? Blue. Very good. What yeah. color is your favorite color? Blue one. Blue one. It's a blue one. All right, fantastic. Do you have pictures and stuff already ready to go? I have to print them out. Believe it or not, we have to print them out. Huh. Great. Print them out though at CVS tomorrow, and then we'll glue them on the inside. Well, why, oh, oh, we don't have a color printer? No. Hmm. Okay. All right, well, that's Black fun. And white one. Give us a reason to get out of the house and go over the bridge. There you go. Well, this is great. He couldn't be happier. Mm-hmm. Hey, Nick James, do you like painting? Yes, yes. You do. I know you do. Happy, happy. I know. You're always happy when you're home. You're happy when you're painting at home, right, buddy? Okay. Yeah. Aunt Jean is coming to see you. Okay. Maybe we're going to go over to the beach. Beachy. Okay. All right. Yes, it's going to be fantastic. It'd be awesome if we could take the dogs with us, but maybe not today. All right. Coping box is actually a great idea, and it was the job coach's idea which is a little plus for her, right? And she's probably fantastic. Mrs. Harrison says she's fantastic. We have no reason to doubt her. She has incredible judgment and we trust her. This whole thing with the school district is really more about the administration's obsession with having a singular voice coming from the district, which is the opposite of getting to the truth when, when there's a question about things. You need objective voices in the room. You need other people saying, no, this is what I saw or this is what I think. And when that happens, it gets you to challenge your own assumptions and you get closer to the truth. The district doesn't want to have anything to do with that. And no one's saying anyone's lying. We don't think the district is doing anything bad aside from 
trying to filter every piece of information and having it run through administration before a parent finds out, which is ridiculous. It just, it just screams, I have so much to hide. And so hopefully we get past all of this, right? This is, this is more about, I think, a personal style of administration from our, um, from our head of edu uh, uh, special education, Lisa Consolo, and our superintendent, Brian Convoy. I think it's a mistake. One thing that happened during my phone conversation yesterday with the head of special education is pretty important and I didn't, I didn't mention it in yesterday's video. Part of the dialogue that we've been having is, hey, he's, got a, he's supposed to be in a 12 one, one classroom. The jobs coach must be serving as the one teacher during this time. And she made it a point to really point out to me to say, no, that's not the teacher. I said, well, if that's the case, if that's the case, you're violating his IEP. And she's basically like, yeah, we are. You know, your, your son's entitled to four and a half hours a day, not the whole day, which is, which is true, but he's not with Mrs. Harrison four and a half hours or, you know, in gym or with, or, or in a 12 one one setting outside of the time that he's with the jobs coach. So we just assume that the jobs coach is taking the role as teacher. She's saying, no, that's not the case. And I said, well, then he's not getting his hours. She's like, no, no, he's not. You're right. Very nonchalantly and very directly, like wanting me to absolutely be clear on that information that the IEP is not being satisfied, which is um, surprising to me. And I'm not quite sure why she's doing that yet, right? In fact, she wants me to come in, have an IEP meeting and change the, uh, change the number of hours that he's required to be uh, in the 1211 so that the program that they have in place is actually accommodating the IEP. I, I don't, I, I'm not quite understand how, uh, I don't understand how we got to this place, frankly. I mean, why didn't they push for this back in May when we were redoing his IEP for this year? I mean, obviously she would have known that the hours weren't going to match up. And I think there's a piece of her that possibly just saying, hey, look, we don't have a program that's gonna accommodate your son if you wanna leave the IEP where it is. And that kind of leaves me in a place that says, all right, either change the IEP and say, all right, fine, we, we don't need them in a 12 one one for four and a half hours. Let's lessen it so that it matches the program that we have. Or the argument is, um, well, no, I, I, I want him, his IEP states that he's supposed to be in a 12 one one for four and a half hours. Let's make that happen. Put a, maybe put a, uh, a teacher in there with the job coach. I don't know, something along those lines. I'm going to have to really think this through and figure it out. I'd love to know your opinion on it. I do know one thing about our head of special education. She will not hesitate to say this program is not for you. <laughs> you could go somewhere else and uh, that's not going to fly for sure. They're going to be in a, for a much bigger fight than they anticipate if that is their mindset. And just to fill in some of our new viewers, the first three years of Nick's education, he was, going, he was shipped out of district, right? They said the program wasn't for him. We can't accommodate his needs. You have to go to some other schools. And it was a disaster year after year. And we showed up the fourth year and say that's you know that's enough we're coming he, you can't discriminate against our son because of his disability make a program and we showed up on the first day of school knowing there was no class but we showed up and i argued with the principal i argued with the head of special ed uh there was a big blow up right in the front lobby but we weren't leaving we we went there and we demanded that they start a program and i think they were thinking about it already you know, I, I'd sent emails. I didn't just show up. I'd sent emails saying, hey, look, we're coming. Ready or not, here we come. And they kept saying to us, look, there's no class here for your son. And they were going to treat it as an, ab an abandonment issue. And however they were going to do that, I end up getting to this huge argument with the principal who was already incredibly stressed that day. And just he blew up on me and we're screaming at each other in, in the hallway in front of all of the kids on the first day of school. And um, ultimately that ended, that ended up becoming a, a conversation with the uh, superintendent. And after a week, the superintendent decided if, you know, we wanted, maybe we wanted, I think they wanted to do it anyway. I'm not really sure, frankly, but they said, we're gonna start a 611. They had a, they had a 1211, they started the 611 and Nicholas was gonna be the first student. And he was, and he said, but you gotta, you're gonna have to, you know, we'll provide home instruction. You'll have to homeschool them because we've got to hire somebody. They little, they didn't have a space. They didn't have a teacher. They didn't have anything, and they started one. And Nick was the was the first student, and he was alone in that class until they got their second student. I believe it was like January, and we had to homeschool him for a month. So, 
we went through a lot to get Nicholas into this, into Babylon, because I think every special ed kid deserves to have a program built around them in their home district. The problem was is that nobody knew who Nicholas was in his hometown, right? And uh, he wasn't part of the community. He was going to a school, you know, 30 minutes away where no, no one knows us. Now everybody in town knows him, right? And that's important. The school is the hub of the community and every kid deserves to be part of that. And that's how we feel. I don't think kids should be forced to leave district for any reason. I don't care if they're medically fragile, whatever their disability is, we should be building programs around those kids in the buildings that we have. And I'm not gonna change my mindset on that because I, it has been life-changing. And I knew this from the school that I worked in, where we had a great special ed program, where it's mixed in with the regular ed kids. They're, they're hallway rock stars. All the regular ed kids want, first of all, the special ed classroom is the best place in the building. Everybody's happy, the kids are happy. They got, I mean, the, all, all the uh, support staff work together as an incredible team. There's always great energy. Uh, every building should have that. So we're not backing down and we're not going anywhere. So I'm not really sure why she went out of her way to point out that is, IEP is not being met. That's usually something you want to try to avoid, but she's forcing that conversation and wanting me to come in and change it. I don't understand. What would be the uh, motivation for me to go and do that, right? It sounds like she's trying to force the argument that says, hey, look, if you don't change it, we're not accommodating the IEP and we don't have a program that's going to fit him, so therefore you got to leave. Maybe that's what she's thinking. Well, they, they got to try something. They're trying to intimidate me and they can see that's not going to happen. Our superintendent tells me on the telephone, he's a hot-headed guy. He's at the end of his career. He's a uh, interim superintendent. He had a full career in Seaford. Uh, he was a year or two in Massapequa, my district. He was actually my boss. And now he's the interim in Babylon, right? And you can tell this guy, he's accustomed to getting his way. He's accustomed to people being quiet when he speaks, right? And so our first meeting, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Consolo and I, the head of special ed, are going back and forth pretty hard at it because we were talking about the whole issue over, you know, when the uh, after school program guys were hired. There was this whole discrepancy over whether she even contacted them because the agency said that they never called. And, and she's saying, oh, no, she told us directly, you know, no, did you call? And then during the meeting with the superintendent, she's like, no, 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 I did call. And so I interrupted her and I said, you told me you didn't call, you know. And so the superintendent didn't like that, you know, I didn't sit quietly and all of that. And, and what he did, he tried to mediate the, the conversation, which was the right thing. He says, all right, we, listen, we can't talk over each other and that kind of thing. And that was fine. But our following phone call, after a contentious phone call that I had with Ms. Ms. Consolo, he was heated and he said to me, this is what he says to me. I said, are you aware that your job coaches don't, don't call the parents? And he says to me, can you understand why we wouldn't want all of our employees to call someone like you? I was like, I was, I was like, what? I actually chuckled a little bit because it got so personal. I said, well, yeah, hey, that's, that's pretty personal, a little unprofessional. Called him right on on it. And instead of getting angry, I got, actually got calmer because I think that was his objective to try to get me angry. And I said, what are you talking about? Why, why would you make this so personal? And he says to me, you made it personal. And uh, so I, I don't know if this guy was doing this by strategy or if he just has a really bad temper. I, I tend to believe it's just that he has a temper issue for sure, right? And I said, well, what did I do to make it personal? Did I use profanity? Did I call her names? He says, no, you interrupted. I said, whoa, I interrupted. Oh, I'm, I interrupted, oh. And, and, he, and he qualified my behavior as disgusting. He said, your behavior was disgusting in that meeting. And I wanted an explanation for that. And he couldn't come up with anything other than I interrupted. Because that was the truth. That's what I did, I interrupted. I didn't, I didn't scream at her or call her names or anything like that or use profanity, I don't do that, right? But that's not even the kind of thing that holds me back from having a productive meeting in the future. I don't, I don't, I understand people get angry, right? Sometimes you have to have some fiery conversation to get to the truth to get to a place of understanding. So I don't hold a grudge. I'm not mad at him at all. But that's the kind of people, that's the kind of person I'm dealing with, for sure. And after these kinds of events happen, I think about other families. I think about people who are in meetings with people like our head of special ed and our superintendent. Our head of special ed who doesn't mind just changing the story as, as she goes. And our superintendent who can try to, who can be intimidating. Doesn't intimidate me.
but I'm, I can see how it is intimidating to other people, right? You don't know what it's like to be in these kinds of meetings unless you're advocating for a special needs child. If you've ever been in an IEP meeting where all of us, they have 10 people at the table and you're there with your spouse and there's a unified voice, there's not an objective voice in the room. They already talked and know exactly what they're going to say. Everybody's in agreement, right? And you don't expect it. You think you go in there so that they could all help you and you learn very quickly they're not all there to help you, right? And so I think about a lot of parents that don't have the tool. At least I have, a, I have a background in education, right? I'm comfortable in confrontation as well. So I have the tools to try to, to advocate, to do pretty well for our family when it comes to this kind of stuff. What about the people that don't? They just kind of shut down and they hide from all this. And then you, I spoke to a, I got a message today and her name, her name escapes me. But she started homeschooling, right? And if, and if you're watching this video, please, please comment. She started homeschooling, homeschooling because of the amount of time and effort and energy she was putting into just dealing with the administration. It was, to, it was being taken away from her ability to support a child. So she said, you know what, forget it. I'll bring the kid home. And, and she says it was the best move she ever made. And I understand that. And that day's coming for my family. It doesn't, you know, one way or the other, in the next five years, Nick's going to be home with us. And we start our home school, our home job education. And that day's coming. And I accept that. And I'm looking forward to it. Well, that came out fantastic. Nikki, your box looks great. Thank you. Say goodbye to everybody. No pressure. It's been a time. Very good, Nick. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next time.